Hello, students, and welcome to Counseling Skills and Techniques. I hope you have prepared for this class. I hope you're anticipating it and are ready to get underway. In this first week together, we want to take a look at our objectives that we have for the course. We have seven. But before we do that, let's take a look at the way this course fits into your program. It's actually more of a hands-on approach to counseling. Um, up to this point, perhaps for you, it, it's been more theory, um, not a lot of practical application. This course is really between all those classes on theory and then your practicum and internships. It's sort of a, a halfway point where you can actually uh, put into practice some of the things that you've been learning. It would be something like a uh, baseball team, let's say. You're in the uh, locker room, the coach is giving you some guidance, preparing you, giving you some pointers on how to play baseball. And then uh, the coach finally says, all right, let's go out on the field and do some more practicing. And you go out on the field and you actually begin to throw the ball around, uh, hit the ball with the bat, um, do some fielding, perhaps running the bases, and things like this. Counseling skills and techniques is perhaps sort of the first time we get out of the, the locker room and actually uh, do some very measured counseling. We're going to do mock counseling. It's not going to be with, we would say, uh, regular or real clients. It's going to be with classmates. And, and so it's more of a safe way of beginning to expose ourselves to counseling. Course outcomes. Number one, we want to evaluate active listening and relationship skills. We want to learn how to be active listeners. We want to work on our relationship skills as counselors because we know that of all the things that determine the success or failure of counseling, the first is the therapeutic alliance. So we want to work on that first. Second, we want to explain how cultural diversity interacts with client and counselor worldviews. We want to be aware of that, don't we? We want to train ourselves to uh, be sensitive to and to pick up and have insight toward the client's worldview. We also want to view and understand our own worldviews and to conceptualize those things as we're going through the therapeutic process, being careful to be aware of transference and counter-transference. Third, we want to demonstrate in realistic triadic role play sessions, specific ethical and culturally relevant strategies, meaning that when we have our time of actually uh, practicing our counseling, we'll kind of going to get in triadic roles where there's going to be three, two are in the actual counseling, one being the counselor, one being the counselee, then the third individual is going to be the observer and then to rotate. Those are the triadic role sessions. And then some will be dyadic where there's just the counselor and the counselee. We want to be aware of the ethical and culturally relevant strategies for maintaining the therapeutic relationship as we go through these dyadic and triadic practice sessions. The fourth course outcome is to analyze the counselor characteristics and behaviors that promote the development of the person, the therapist, and influence the counseling process. What are the things about us our characteristics, our behaviors 
that influence the process of therapy. We want to become very self-aware without being consumed with how we're coming across. Fourth, demonstrate essential active listening, uh, relationship, case conceptualization skills needed to create and maintain effective therapeutic alliance, and very importantly, with diverse clients. When we're engaged in therapy, we're thinking about, are we listening well? Are we maintaining relationship? Have we conceived of the uh, case in a proper way? Does it need um, editing or altering uh, in our minds? And then we're adjusting to our client and are aware of perhaps a diverse client that presents a different um, scenario perhaps than we're accustomed to. And then the next course outcome is to apply criteria that influence the development of a personal model of counseling. What, what will be our personal mode and style? The principles of counseling remain the same, but the way that we apply them personally it becomes what we would say our style, our professional style. And then the last, the seventh course outcome is to think critically regarding the biblical, theological, and philosophical assumptions of contemporary counseling skills and techniques and demonstrate the use of a Christian worldview approach to therapeutic concepts and practice. We want to understand the importance of spirituality and counseling, how it weighs upon the therapeutic enterprise, and specifically the Christian worldview lends to us so many strengths and advantages that we want to be aware of and take advantage of given the opportunities in therapy. So as we go forward here, Let's pause and talk a bit more about the Christian worldview. I want to present to you 10 principles from the Christian worldview that I believe can impact us when it comes to specifically uh, counseling strategies and therapies. The first one is this, Christian counselors choose skills and techniques in as much as they comply with Scripture. Those of us who try to be serious Christians, to follow the guidance of Scripture, we want to be individuals who bring under the Lordship of Christ uh, not just what we do on Sunday mornings, perhaps, uh, in worship, but throughout the week and which would include our vocation, uh, namely counseling. When it comes to skills and techniques, some Christian counselors may say, well, do these comply with scripture? Am I allowed to use these things? And I would say that after studying these techniques and strategies over the years, I have found them to be very much in compliance with scripture. Perhaps there's a few exceptions, but very few. And most of them, I would say, are replicated or um, at least allowed by scripture. And so I believe there's a, there's a reassurance there when it comes to skills and techniques fitting into the Christian worldview. First Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I believe undertaking this course from a Christian worldview, learning skills and techniques can glorify God. The second Christian principle that I want to offer for your consideration is that Christian counselors should be aware of God's enabling grace. Enabling grace means that God provides the resources to do his will. 
we look at these skills and techniques and we can be assured as Christians that God enables, God provides the means for us to do this. This includes being a therapist and carrying out competent, skilled practice on a professional level. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency. There's something greatly reassuring about the fact that a Christian has a secure relationship with God through his son for all eternity. And that that means not just a, a final destination after this life, but the enabling presence and power of God throughout this lifetime, and specifically when it comes to uh, applying skills and techniques as a therapist. The third principle is Christian counselors should demonstrate competence. We may think initially that's a bit contradictory to what was just said in point number two. But actually, it highlights the duality between the enabling grace of God and the cooperative will of the Christian therapist. To depend on the fact that we are God's children and have his enabling grace um, does not mean counselor laziness or lethargy or passivity. We use our will in cooperation with God's grace to sufficiently do his will. So we depend on him to give us the enablement and the power to do his will. But on the other hand, we use our will to utilize that. Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. We don't want to be hasty in our skills and techniques. We want to diligently understand, plan, and implement them. And then our fourth principle here is that Christian counselors establish and maintain an alliance. That is a given uh, in our texts. That's a given in, quote, unquote, secular counseling. And I repeat it here just as a reminder that the Christian counselor um, agrees with that and how important it is to maintain an alliance. Of all the skills and strategies in counseling, the therapeutic alliance is the most predictive of success. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Among all those out in the counseling world, and all of those who understand the importance of the uh, counselor alliance, um, from Rogers forward, it should be the Christian counselor who understands that this is one of the, the basic expectations of the Christian life, uh, to love others, to give them this unconditional positive regard, this congruence, this empathy uh, that should be demonstrated in counseling. The fifth Principle is Christian counselors do not sacrifice the truth. Loving clients unconditionally, um, applying person-centered therapy, as Rogers would say, does not mean that we lay aside the truth. The truth is not sacrificed on the altar of love. We are advocates of both truth and love. It's just that the timing of the love and the timing of the truth, in terms of the expression of these two in the counseling setting, that's the real challenge. Ephesians 4.15 says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. Notice the truth and the love there. We are advocates of both truth and love. The sixth 
principle is Christian counselors are good listeners and speak judiciously. Active listening, we've heard that a lot um, through our classes and through our, our learning to be a counselor. Active listening is one of the most important strategies. Knowing that therapy is often processing thoughts. Therapy is not the counselor becoming um, a professor or a teacher or a preacher, um, regardless of how important those are, but rather uh, the counselor is a facilitator enabling or helping, giving opportunity to the client processing their thoughts and actively listening to those with what we call minimal encouragers. Oftentimes, it is the verbal processing that the client undertakes, which brings the real healing rather than the therapist's, um, let's say, great insights that are offered. Proverbs 18.13 says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and shame to him. We need to listen before we speak. And Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. The sixth, excuse me, the seventh principle is Christian counselors ask good questions, often open-ended. An essential skill is asking relevant questions. Good questions help the client self-reflect, process, and realize how to best think and act about their challenges. In Genesis 3.9, God offers a question to Adam and Eve. He says, then the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? I would say the, that was the first question to the first sinners. It was not God raining down lightning and sending Adam and Eve to hell forever. It was rather a very uh, empathetic, loving, and, and searching question. He's looking for his creation. He's looking for his errant couple that have gone their own way without him. And thus, God demonstrates for us the importance of open-ended uh, rhetorical questions. It wasn't for his, uh, his insight that he asked the question, but rather it was for Adam and Eve, the two clients. Number eight, Christian counselors can restate, summarize, and illustrate. Uh, in the process of helping the client think in new ways, we do pause in our listening to restate and summarize, don't we? Pretty common sense, but it's important to highlight it here. And then when appropriate, we, we illustrate, summarize, uh, illustrate, restate, all of these things. Think with me about Psalm 23, 1 to 3, where the psalmist there, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Notice the metaphor there, shepherd. David could have said, the Lord is my um, caregiver. Uh, the Lord watches over me. Um, the Lord is my protector. But instead, he gives an illustration. He gives this metaphor. And it's this delightful one that the ancient world knew quite a bit about, a shepherd. And by using this word, in one of the most memorable psalms and passages in the entire Bible. It, it brings a new warmth and empathy and insight about the character of God toward his people. So the writer says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because he's my shepherd, there's not going to be all this anxiousness. Why? He makes me delight on green pastures, one of the favorite places for Cheap. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
not turbulent waters, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He restores my innermost being. Christians, therefore, can use illustrations when appropriate. And of course, we've got to be very careful because it's not always about illustrations, these brilliant illustrations we come up with. And also, it's not about us being autobiographical, telling stories about ourselves, but rather it's at particular times that are poignant and important that we bring in perhaps a restatement, a summary, an illustration, and not very often, but rarely, we'll even talk about perhaps a story about ourselves. And then number nine, Christian counselors believe in autonomy. That's important for Christian counselors to know because some of us as Christian counselors understand that a part of our discipleship means that we want to be available to people to share our faith. We call it the Great Commission in the Gospels, where Jesus told his disciples just before he was to leave this earth to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that wherever we do this, he would be with us, even to the ends of the earth. But that evangelistic call, or that call to evangelism, is not a call to run roughshod over people, and in particular clients. We need to remember that God grants autonomy, free will, that God created man in his image. Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. And that image uh, includes a free will. God allows people to make their own choices. God gave man the dignity of causality. Even if man chooses to go his own way and to reject God, Christian counselors understand that. Christian counselors, in giving people autonomy, and their own decision to do what they want in terms of their relationship with God gives a certain level of comfort and assurance to the Christian counselor knowing that God himself agrees in giving people autonomy. And then the last is that Christian counselors can look to Jesus as the ultimate example of counseling skills and techniques there's a wonderful passage in Isaiah, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Jesus was a counselor. And we can say, I think safely, that no one counseled like Jesus in terms of self-awareness, competence, alliance, Truth and love, listening, speaking judiciously, asking open-ended questions. He, as the master illustrator, all of these things that we pointed out, he was par excellence. In Luke 24, 32, there were two people who spent some time with Jesus walking along the road north of Jerusalem. Jesus had risen from the dead. He appeared to these two men. They didn't realize it was him at first. They had this long conversation along this road. Once they realized it was Jesus, and after he left, they said to one another, and here's our passage, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road? while he was explaining the scriptures to us. I want to encourage those who want to employ these or this model of Jesus to think in terms of your own counseling 
not so much as um, a job, not so much as a vocation, but in terms of ministry where you can serve God and serve others. Counseling skills and techniques are going to help us do that. So this is a class that's important because it fits in right with our curriculum. And then we have these seven outcomes that we want to, to work on. And then finally, a general introduction to the Christian worldview where we can understand perhaps how the Christian worldview can be used in our counseling. I hope you're looking forward to these weeks together. I hope you do well. Take care.